Thank you and happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful day. It's good to be together. It's good to hear some uh, wonderful singing with some uh, first soprano soaring over the congregation and um, some beautiful piano. The choice of 100 was perfect um, with the season changing. Um, <clears throat> I have a song, I'm not the best singer in the world, and I know that my wife will criticize me when I'm done, but I'm going to sing it anyway. Can I keep to your violin? Avinu malkeinu Avinu malkeinu Chanenu v'anenu Chanenu v'anenu ki en banu masim Ase imanu Tzedaka v'chesed Ase imanu tzedaka v'chesed Ve'oshienu So that's a song that uh, you probably got the melody as Jewish. And uh, the title of this song is uh, Avinu, our father, Malkenu, our king. Today I have one subject that I intended to preach on and I put that in the bulletin, but I want to speak about two things and link them together. And um, I was going to ask some people for du double duty reading, but we'll just do that during the message. Um, <clears throat> we're back to school, back to school days, and back to uh, the curriculum, which is that we have here in church, and that's the Bible. Um, I uh, want to remind you of what we have uh, studied together while I was here uh, in the first part of the year. We, uh, we opened the Bible in the Gospel, and uh, that was the Gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew, there was a chapter that we studied in detail. We uh, uh, studied some stories of Jesus in which he tells us of the characteristics of God's kingdom, of the way that the church and God's kingdom are supposed to be. We studied this in the parables of the soils, in the story of the wheat and the tares, and I remember how the kids played something beautiful with some of the adults too. Uh, parable of mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, the parable of the dragnet, and so on and so forth. And uh, as opposed to what people thought the kingdom of God was like, uh, they thought it was visible, it was just for a few people, and it was something future. Jesus said, no, 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 no. The kingdom's characteristics are that the kingdom of God is for everybody. It's not just for Jews, it's not just for men, it's for everybody of all time. And it's something that's uh, not visible, uh, it's not identifiable with the steeple, or it's not identifiable with people that are dressed a certain way and have curls around their ears or something like this. It's, it's, it's work, it's work it's, is invisible. It takes place in people's life uh, through the Holy Spirit, working through what we call the good things and what we call the bad things too. It's everywhere. And that is not something that you have to wait for the future. It's right here and right now. It will grow into a greater fruition and fulfillment in the future, but right now it's present. And so Jesus said, the kingdom of God in these parables of Matthew 13 is universal, it's invisible, it's mysterious, and it's present right now. Now, when Jesus told these stories, he told about the characteristics of the kingdom. But he did not yet expound greatly on the program that would bring about the kingdom of God. And if you look at Matthew 13, uh, it's followed be between Matthew 18, uh, 13 and the next set of stories that Jesus told in Matthew 18, in Luke 15, the parable of the Good Samaritan, of the lost sheep, of the prodigal son, all of these uh, beautiful stories. There is a little interval in which I believe Jesus did some thinking. Look at Matthew 14. I'll go very briefly through the chapters. So you can have a look at it. And the thinking that Jesus went through was a, th a thinking regarding what is it that will bring about the kingdom? What program? Is it doing what I have done so far? Or is it something different? Now, <clears throat> if you have your Bibles open and you look at Matthew 14, um, the 
uh, first verse all the way to basically verse 11. Um, what is the title of the paragraph of the story that you have uh, there, the main story regarding the uh, first uh, verses of uh, Matthew 14? John the Baptist, that's right. And uh, specifically, John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Jesus, and basically in the same business as Jesus was. He was a preacher and a spiritual leader. John the Baptist was murdered. He died. Now, we all know people who die of old age and so on and so forth, but when your own cousin, first cousin, is murdered, that might have an influence on your life, especially if you're in the same kind of business, right? So now Jesus think of, uh, thinks of this, and I think the Holy Spirit, in putting this in order right here, is having a purpose. Then uh, the next paragraph from verse 13, and basically goes all the way to verse 33, but, uh, and so on. But what's the, begin the title that you have for your paragraph starting with verse 13? The feeding of the five thousands. Uh, and uh, that is an occasion that's related at length. If you recall in John chapter six, uh, Jesus multiplies bread for a crowd of 5,000 people. And uh, when the crowd sees this, they say this, is a good guy to have as a king. He can give us free bread. But Jesus, perceiving this, escapes. He sends everybody away very rushingly, goes up to the mountain by himself, sends his disciples on the other side of the, of, of the lake, and he goes and he prays. Am I going to be a Messiah that gets big things done like this? Am I going to be a show-off that provides stuff? or? Is my work going to be different? And when he comes back to his disciples, they are scared to see him because there's something different about him. Now, if you continue uh, turning the pages, uh, I'm going to go away uh, further. Uh, chapter 16, Jesus withdraws. And then um, uh, we have here something that is first vocalized by Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, I'm reading, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, that's the religious establishment, and be killed and be raised the third day. That's the first, that is the first vocalization of Jesus' program to bring about the kingdom, his death and resurrection. Resurrection through death. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and say, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus here is contrasting an idea of how to bring about the kingdom of God, which Peter thought was the good one, through action, through things that you can see, and so on and so forth. And he says, No, no, that's not going to be this way. It's going to be through death, which is unpleasant, and that will bring life, resurrection. Then we have the transfiguration. If you recall in chapter 17 of uh, Matthew, it's not like in Luke, but in Luke, uh, we see Elijah and Elisha and uh, Moses who are talking with Jesus about his exodus, which he would accomplish in Jerusalem. The word exodus is the same Greek word from which we get the word exit. And that's basically, once again, a reference to what? To his death. Jesus here is thinking between Matthew 13 and Matthew 18, he's thinking not about the characteristics of the kingdom, that's pretty clear to him, but how the program of what would bring about the kingdom, what would bring about salvation. And then, uh, <clears throat> once again, uh, Matthew 17, verse 22, Jesus a second time gives uh, a, a prediction of what will happen. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day, he will be raised up. Resurrection through death. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And then after this is the text that I intended to speak about to you today. It's uh, an acted parable. It's the first one of those parables in which Jesus talks about which program will bring about the kingdom. But before I go to that text, which is the very last verses of Matthew 17, I want you to note that throughout the parables, which I call the parables of grace, Jesus 
is applying his death, uh, uh, which will lead to life in very practical ways to the way that uh, um, people live. Uh, the first story that Jesus will tell is the parable of the what sheep? The lost sheep, right? And then uh, there is the story about um, the workers of the 11 hours. In that parable, in that story, is it the first that are uh, being blessed? Which one are the ones that are being paid first? The what? The last. Then uh, another instance in there, there is a discussion between the disciples as far as it's at the beginning of chapter 18. Who is the greatest? And of course, they're all thinking of the typical Jewish religious mindset of who is the greatest? And what does Jesus do? He bring, does he bring somebody important who's doing all the stuff? He brings what to them? A what? What kind of child? A little child. I'm saying this so you can remember. It's a, it's a mnemotechnic that's very easy. So far, we've seen the lost sheep and the last and the little. And then he says, the one who wants to be the greatest needs to be the least. It all starts with letter L there. And throughout these parables, Jesus is applying the way that we get to goodness uh, in the religious realm, in the spiritual realm, he says, uh, is not by uh, the greatness and the firstness of what you do and what you don't, what you believe and what you don't believe, and what you uh, do for worship and so on and so forth. These are important. Don't take me wrong. It's important to have worship together in the right way. It is important to have beliefs, and it's important to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to have ethical requirements and all these things, especially for living in community. I mean, people who uh, smoke in my nose really are not pleasant to me. Maybe not to you either. Um, actually, sometimes I like the, this nice smell, but uh, <clears throat> it's not really the best thing in the world. And when people are making noise and intruding on your space, that's not good manners. It irks me. Maybe it irks you too. But what Jesus is saying is, in these things, these things are irrelevant, useless, and ineffective towards salvation, towards the kingdom. The do's and the don'ts that the religious community has set as ways that people can get to God, creed, cult, and ethical requirements may be useful for social life, but as far as God is concerned, he loves you no matter what, and it's useless and absolutely in actually very little effectiveness towards making you feel the peace and joy of salvation. Jesus, having come to this realization, changes from his seriousness and becomes even a little humorous. And that's where this last uh, verses of Matthew 17 uh, can be read with the title of instruction about taxes. Now the taxes that are being talked about here are not the taxes that we pay here, it's the temple tax. The tax that every Jewish person in the religious uh, context of uh, Judaism was uh, to pay every year uh, for the maintenance of, um, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, um, the temple. So that's what we're talking about here. And um, it starts with a story about people coming to Peter when Jesus apparently was not here. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax, the temple tax, came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Verse 25, and he said, yeah. Probably not because he knew, but because he wanted to get off the hook here. But when they had come, when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, even though, even though he was not there uh, during that conversation. He seems to know what was, what was going on. And he said, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From the sons or from strangers. 
Now that doesn't make sense much to us, maybe, but or from their citizens or the, from their strangers. Peter said to him, from strangers, and Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. Now, the, um, uh, the temple tax here is something that was part of what was expected religiously in the religious establishment of Jesus' day to be a good citizen, one that was upstanding and respected, and so on and so forth. Um, now, there's one word that's kind of difficult to translate here. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's sons. When, um, when Jesus asked Peter, whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or their strangers, we as American citizens are used to paying taxes even though we are sons of the country or citizens of the country. But in that time, really, what was done usually was to have uh, strangers from other people, from other, other lands, paying taxes, and actually uh, the citizens would not pay. Um, uh, it still happens in some countries, like in Monaco. <laughs> they have a nice casino, and everybody goes there, pays money, but people from Monaco do not pay, Monte Carlo do not pay a dime of taxes and but in America we don't but that's the point that he was making here is now um, we are children of God I am the son of God Peter has said to Jesus you are the son of God he has recognized that there's sonship there there's a relationship that Jesus is part of the family he is the son of God and by extension because they are his disciples and those that believe and are with him, they are also part of the sonship. As was read earlier, we have received the spirit of adoption. We are, we are part of God's family. He loves us as his father. And so Jesus says, uh, in the world, um, it is from strangers, those that are not part of the family, that taxes are being collected. But since we are children of God, since we are accepted, since we are part of the family as sons, as daughters of God, do we owe any of these things that the religious establishment is telling us that we ought to pay in order to be able to be accepted by God? And the obvious answer is what? No. And it's not that it's not useful to maintain the temple. It's not that it's not useful to have high ethical requirements and, and correct beliefs and so on and so forth. But is it something that's imposed like the imposition of a tax. Is it something you must and should do? Jesus says, no. Why? Because you're already accepted. It's not something that's connected at all. And so Jesus makes his point very clearly with his mouth. He says, therefore, the sons are free. We are free. We do not have to pay that. We do not have to do these things. It's not something that we must do. Having made this point, having come to the realization that because it's through death, through lastness, through all these things that come to us, uh, that we get an understanding that life is coming to us, understanding that God accepts us as we are and loves us, Jesus realized that we are free from the requirements of religion, from the do's and don'ts. And uh, uh, he, he now shows us all the behavior stuff that is uh, the church and the religious establishments are so eager to impose on people as, as conditions to salvation. He says you're not, though they be useful to society, he says that's less than useful, it's less than effective, and we're not bound up by this. Having realized this, that he is free from all this, Jesus goes on to give a humorous allegory. He uses uh, funny, uh, acted parable, and he says to Peter, uh, nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money, take that and give it to them for me and for you. And the piece of money is a didrachma, which is exactly the change that is needed for that temple tax for two people. And he sends Peter, who is a net fisherman, he sends him to take a hook and do some cast fishing. All of this is funny. 
And Jesus is using this because now he's free from all this. He realizes the freedom that there is for him as son of God and for all of those that are part of God's family. He realizes that there's acceptance apart from these things. He goes on and says, well, lest we offend them. Here it is. Now, that's, that's, in a nutshell, I wanted to show you that as Jesus thought about the program that brings about the kingdom of God, he's very clear what it is that will not bring it. It's not behavior amelioration. It is not the do's and don'ts. These may be useful, but they're not effective for that. He says, however, that it is based on God's acceptance, the way that we understand and that we get to a greater realization of the goodness that God has given us is even through the difficulties, the lastness, the lostness, the leastness of life. In one word, death brings about life. Um, if we are willing to just see how it can work for us. I want to give you a quick explanation, practical one, of how this works. And I want to link this to specifically what day of the year we are in today and what song I sung at the beginning of this uh, uh, service here. And uh, to uh, let you know what day of the year we're in today, you may be aware of it, maybe you're not, I will turn to Leviticus chapter 23. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26, we have here the instructions as part of a chapter on all the feasts that uh, God has uh, given to the Jewish people. I know that as Adventists, we don't necessarily have to, we don't need to, we don't teach those, but they are part of the biblical background that we have. And so there were feasts that the Jewish people used to celebrate. And the one that I want to focus on uh, is described in uh, Leviticus 23, verses 26 uh, to 32. If you look from the beginning of the chapter, however, you'll see that the Sabbath is first. And that's not a yearly uh, feast, it's a weekly one. But then there's the feast of uh, the Passover, then the feast of the first fruits, then the feast of the weeks, which is Pentecost. And then uh, uh, verse 23 goes to the feast of trumpets, the day of atonement, and the feast of tabernacles. Hmm? There's the Sabbath uh, first, and then three feasts that took place in the spring, and three that took place in the fall of the year. The one that I'm focusing on is uh, verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also, the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day shall person will uh, destroy from, I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no man or work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate this holiday. And that is the day that we are uh, in today. I happen to have a mother who lives in, in Israel. Um, and uh, she keeps in touch, of course, with what's going on there. And since yesterday evening, for the Jewish people throughout the world, this is the most holy day and Sabbath of the entire year. It's the Yom Kippur. Uh, it's a day of atonement. Mm -hmm. And um, now, I, again, I'm saying I know that we as Adventists, that's not part of what we uh, really do. Uh, but it's still something that's in the scripture and something that has significance for us in, uh, in some way. It's that time of year when the... Uh, sky becomes bluer, deeper, the air becomes cooler, there's a refreshing of the air and there's also a refreshing that is meant to be for the soul and the, uh, with that day of atonement and the fall holidays. Uh, it comes 10 years after the, 10 uh, days, excuse me, after the new year, which is Rosh Hashanah, and that was uh, Wednesday, not of last week, but the week before. And uh, for Rosh Hashanah, the people in Israel will say, well, Shana Tova, which is Happy New Year. Uh, but for the Day of Atonement, the greeting, the greeting between the first day of the year, which uh, was Wednesday a week, 10 days ago, and today is Khatima Tova, which means uh, in English, may you have a good signature. 
And the reason for this is that on this day, the belief is that God in heaven is writing the book, uh, the, the names of those that are part of the family in the book of life. And he's, there's a judgment some, somehow that's going on. Uh, you can read what was going on in the temple in Leviticus chapter 16. It was observed in the temple. Now, of course, there's no temple, and so there's no sacrifices anymore. But it's still observed amongst the Jewish people. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting and, uh, and beautiful celebration. The main thing about this day is that it's a day of fasting and prayer. It's a total fast with no food and no water as well. And it's a day of prayer and confession and of uh, afflicting oneself, but not in a bad way. The song that is being sung, that I sung earlier, Avinu Malkinu, is we are in the presence of a father that cares about us, not just a king. Uh, there's a last meal that's usually taken before sundown with white tablecloth. Everybody, if possible, especially Israel, will wear some white. Uh, no leather belt and no leather shoes on that day. We have nothing. People wear nothing that would remind them of uh, the skin of an animal or anything that was sacrificed for some reason. And there's fasting and a prayer that takes place. Um, about this time of uh, day, 12 noon, towards the end of the afternoon, when the children uh, or the older people might get a little weaker, they start sniffing a little bit of tobacco maybe, or <laughs> but uh, there's no food at all. It's taken. And then the first uh, food that is offered to people after uh, the day is over, the day of fasting is over, usually some nice slices of watermelon yeah, with a lot of sugar and lots of water. Uh, that song, <coughs> Avinu Malkenu, uh, says, uh, because you need to be God, please be merciful to us and answer us because we have no deeds on, of our own. You see, there's an admission in that Jewish song of the fact that we have nothing to present that would make us presentable. It's just the mercy of our Father, the love, the amazing grace of our Father that commends us to his love. Um, do to us uh, according to your justice and your mercy and save us. This is the song. As it's, it's a solemn song. It's a solemn day. Uh, that uh, solemn song that expresses love and respect for a God who is both our king and our father because we have this spirit of adoption as was read this morning which uh, causes us to call God not just God but father, Abba and so that we can uh, enjoy that glorious liberty and freedom from the compulsions of trying to get ourselves there by what we do, our do's and don'ts, what we believe, what we don't, when it's universal, because he loves us all as his children, you see. And so um, <clears throat> this is a day that's uh, observed with, with solemnity. As a matter of fact, that's the only day of the, word, uh, the, 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 the year in which in Jerusalem there's religious people and there's also some people that are not religious. But on that day, that's one day you can sit in the middle of the highway between the capital, Jerusalem, and the busiest city, uh, and the largest city in the nation, Tel Aviv, and all the Mediterranean Strip there, Haifa, and all these cities. You can sit in the middle of the highway the whole day, and there will, be, there will not be one single car driving. People are, because in Judaism, people don't drive uh, during a, a special day like this, and they stay home, even the people that are not religious. In Jerusalem, as well as in Tel Aviv, you will be in the city and hear a silence in the city that you've never heard. Um, in the city, there's not as many animals as we hear in nature, but many a time there will be some noise of radio and television and things like this. Even the religious people on that day will not turn that on. They'll be with a book and quiet and do whatever they want to do, even if they don't go to... The only thing that you hear is the singing in the synagogues, uh, one here and then two blocks later there's another one, and a few blocks more there's another one like this. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important day, that's what I'm trying to say. It's a very important day, and it's observed even by people that don't observe. And uh, uh, it may appear like I'm saying this uh, as, uh, you don't have to do this to get to heaven in Judea, uh, in, in the mind of Jesus, but it's something that I want to draw something out of. Because we as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, among us Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, as you know, are the only Christians to have an idea of the significance of that feast and of the day uh, in our salvation, uh, what it represents. 
and uh, that's a study that would take uh, four times uh, one hour to just go in depth but based on Leviticus 16 uh, what uh, we as Adventists believe is that uh, <clears throat> what was going on in the temple in the observance of that holy day in Judaism in uh, the time of the temple was that there was a removal of something related to sins that took place and um, the records of people's sins was removed from the temple on that day. That's what we understand this to mean. And then based on Hebrews chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, uh, where it tells us that Jesus is our high priest, we have an understanding of the feasts uh, of the Jewish year as symbolic of stages in Christ's work in the history of salvation. You see? That's, and that's something that is not shared by all Christians actually is something very special that we have so the three holidays that took place in the Jewish year during the spring uh, namely Passover and the first fruit and the weeks we see those as happening at the beginning of the Christian era with Passover representing what the death of Christ as of the Passover lamb the first fruits as representing his resurrection as the firstborn from the dead and the feast of weeks which took, took place about 50 days 50 days later as representing uh, the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, Pentecost. So we see this, uh, these, these three holidays that took place in the spring as, as having significance at the beginning of the Christian area um, uh, to our salvation, death of Christ, resurrection, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. While we understand the four holy holidays, the three uh, other holidays, namely the New Year or Trumpets, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles has taken place at the end of the Christian era and also having significance uh, in the uh, history of salvation. And so the uh, Feast of Trumpet, based on uh, Hebrews 8, as well as Daniel 8 and verse 14, we see this as, an, as being the Feast of Trumpet. We see this as the announce of um, the coming of Jesus and of the judgment at the time of, uh, of uh, the Millerite movement that took place in the early 1800s in, uh, in America and throughout the world. The Day of Atonement, we see this as something that's taking place uh, right now uh, since uh, the year of 1844, both in heaven as well as on earth, and it has to do with the pre-advent judgment, the removal of something connected to our sins in heaven in preparation for the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents uh, the coming of Jesus and then the millennium that we spend with him in heaven. So you see how, uh, as, uh, as Christians, we have an understanding of these Jewish yearly feasts as having significance for Christians and for all of humanity because they are part of Christ's ministry uh, throughout uh, the Christian era for our salvation. And in the understanding of the Feast of the Jewish Years, uh, as symbolic, we understand that uh, the uh, Day of Atonement has something to do with uh, removal of something connected to sin immediately prior to the coming of Jesus historically. Now, I think that there's a, a historical significance and a historical application that may be taking place, indeed, as we teach it, since 1844. There's also an existential application that every human being experiences at some point in their life. And that's the removal of something deeper than the bad behaviors and the, good, and, 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 and the improvement of the good behaviors. You see, that's on the surface. That's what we call sins and good deeds. And that is part of our life, but there's something that needs to be improved, removed, saved, that is below this, that we don't see. That, and I see that this is what uh, the work that is being done by God, by the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, in heaven uh, as well as in our hearts, uh, during this time of Earth's history, as well as at some points in our lives, when we come to a realization of what causes us to do what we do. I, I'm impressed on how this is something that matches the beautiful uh, lesson that we studied this morning that was taught to us uh, by Carl on uh, revival and reformation involving a renewal of the mind. And of course, as Seventh-day Adventists that are very good Bible scholars, we mention the mind. But by the mind, I think we also need to mention the emotions, everything that's below the surface. Everything that it is that we do not see 
in our actions, you see, but that causes our actions, which is our thoughts and our feelings, our emotions, and so on and so forth, you see. And uh, what I have observed is that um, that's something that was available to all human beings throughout human history. But uh, even historically, since the beginning of the 1800s, there's been a lot of developments uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the psychological sciences to help people to understand what it is that causes us to do what we do. What it is that causes us below the surface to not do what we do, what we don't do, and so on and so forth. Uh, even what you would call depth psychology. And <clears throat> this study uh, of science can be good and bad, but I would say that uh, science has been a good thing for people to improve their health physiologically. And it's also been a, a good thing for people to help themselves to have better lives uh, in their hearts and in their mind, mentally and emotionally and so on and so forth. And so to tie this up to the Day of Atonement and what I was trying to tell you about what it is that does not bring the kingdom of God, trying to improve the outside, the do's and the don'ts and the so on and so forth, as means to be accepted and to enter into the light, what it is that uh, we are called to do as people uh, that want to grow, and especially perhaps as Seventh-day Adventists that are living during this time of Earth history, in the anti-typical, as we call this, Day of Atonement. I think what uh, I want to tell you on this day, which is the Day of Atonement, uh, specifically this year, is that uh, <clears throat> the removal of records in heaven may be a good thing to do, but what is needed for us is an experiential removal, deep removal of what it is that harms us and limits us in our lives. And that's the program that Jesus was thinking about. That's the program that he wants us to implement, the how of how does this take place. And uh, this morning was a very good introduction to this. Um, uh, Carl used the song uh, 500, Take Time to Be Holy. It's a day of spending time in fasting and prayer. It's a day of um, taking time to be holy. It's something that we don't do. The Sabbath is a weekly day for this. The Yom Kippur used to be a yearly day, but it can be part of our life all the time, to, uh, led by the Spirit, to not morbidly, but to spend time in introspection and finding out, led by the Spirit, how our mind works. Um, <clears throat> take the time to be holy by finding out what it is in our emotions or even sometimes in your uh, physiology that causes us to be upset or, or happy and to act certain ways or to not act certain ways. Uh, to take into consideration this mind that we studied about in the Sabbath school as part of what leads us to renewal and to reformation to a better life on the outside, you see. To identify those blocks to health and happiness that, uh, that cause us to misbehave. I'm going to be a little personal. I shared this with my family yesterday. Um, uh, by the way, yesterday, instead of singing the regular Sabbath song at table, we sung, I sung the Avino Malkinu that I sung at the beginning of the worship. But um, as some of you may know, a couple, um, at the last, the last two weeks of August, Connie's, my wife's parents, were here. And uh, it was a good time that we had with them. It's always a privilege when we have grandparents around. Grandparents are very uh, useful to the lives of people that they love that are younger than them just by being there. And um, it happened that uh, when we were at the airport, we gathered around uh, before uh, to bring them back in Madison to the airport. We gathered around uh, where we would have to separate and we formed a little circle and uh, we asked uh, Abuelo, uh, the, uh, uh, Connie's father, to have prayer. And when he prayed, I realized how much it's been 10 years that my father passed and I have never allowed myself with all the religious, I call this gobbledygook, we know that it's not gobbledygook, but all these things about, oh, I will see him in England. I never allowed myself to cry over that. I never allowed myself to see what difference it made in my life. This morning, I went to uh, Francis Jordan. I thanked him for being a father this morning, showing us the flowers, being there. And, uh, but I realized how much I missed my own father. I was, I was not the time to really be sentimental. I had my family behind. I didn't want to have my daughters laughing more at me than they usually do. I just didn't, so we went away. But I realized yesterday 
as I was talking with someone, uh, how important this morning is for me to just be able 10 years later to finally realize that my dad passed away and I miss him. Uh, because this affects everything. And that's one of the things that affects everything. There's other things that are below the surface, in the mind, in the heart. You see, these are the causes for being angry in many ways for me. I'm upset at this thing that my father went away before I, I didn't expect him. The last time that I saw him was at the airport, at Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. I said goodbye, and he was gone, and then I never saw him again. He lived 5,000 miles away. I didn't have a chance to see him. I'm upset at this. I'm upset at God for this. I'm upset at him for letting me down when I was 40 and I needed to have him. I'm upset. And so a lot of this is there, and it shows up in the way that I relate to people. It relates to the play that, way that I play my violin. I play with lots of passion. You know this as a musician, but sometimes there's too much of it. I need to smooth that out. It affects everything, you see. It affects my habits. It affects my faith, how I relate to God. And this is something that is not on the behavior. So you try to just get those things fixed on the outside and, you know, be nicer and play. But it's always there. And this is like a, an ocean that tries to get out. And unless you try to take care of the ocean first, the behavior will always be screwed up on the outside. You understand? That's why Jesus told do's and don'ts, forget about them. This is useful for people, but as far as getting to God, it's useless. You see? What's important, he says, is to go down in the death uh, of, of introspection, the death of, of darkness, finding out what's in the depth there, led by the Holy Spirit. And as you go through that narrow and dark little door, that's how God through his spirit takes you out into something that you never imagined was possible before. You see? You see, the tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacle comes after Yom Kippur through that day of, of cleansing and fasting by finding out and confessing and getting these things out. Not because you have to, because you are a child of God and you have a glorious liberty of the children of God because it's good for you. You understand what I mean? That's what I'm trying to tell you today. And so, I'm going to close in just a moment. So, so we don't want to look at greatness and all these things that appear good on the outside as what is uh, valuable in the religious world, especially it shouldn't be in the church. We need to value people's dark side and the, the emotions that they have and all these things that maybe not be the best, uh, appear to be the best, the least, the last, the, 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 little, the little, and all these things are useful in God's economy. Littleness is a gift in the people's mind that are religious sometimes they think they have a special pipe to God by having the right creed, the right cult, and the right ethics. These are useful, but at the same time, by thinking that these things are useful for salvation, you miss the real door, the dark one, the little one that gets you where it's supposed to. And so I think that it's an opportunity for us on, th on this day of, of the Day of Atonement, as well as whenever we are led by the Spirit by it, to find out through that dark little door to identify the blocks that you have, that I have, the things that need to be healed, to be saved, that's the same word in Greek I've told you, to function healthy, to be happier, to be saved, to enter into the light, to enter into heaven. That was the realization of Jesus, I think, when he realized that his own death was part of the plan and it would be something that brings good things. It, uh, he realized that all of the other things were futile. It was always like trying to put your finger in a dam that has cracks everywhere. The ocean is behind. That's what needs to be taken care of. Success in any matter, especially in religious matters, has nothing to do with salvation. There's no dues to be paid on this. The children are free. All of these things are paid for. There's nothing meritorious or effective in trying to just fix the outside. Only the gift of God's love being received and in the safety of, of this love, finding out how we can apply this to ourselves, what it is that uh, causes us to act the way that we are. This is what will bring the goodness that we want in our lives. The song that I sung, um, the title is Avino Malkenu. I would like to close with another song that I'll play with my violin this time. Um, and uh, by, uh, by the way, the f another thing that was very good about the lesson today 
was when he talked about uh, being uh, fasting from, um, from vain addictions that are smoke screens and dreaming. The entertainment was uh, referred to. And also these things that are distracting and time consuming distractions in our lives. There's no way to apply ourselves to the beautiful work of human growth when we spend our time being addicted in dreams drunk through watching, reading, uh, 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 drinking, and all of these things. And there's no way for us to be in earnest and serious about the task, the wonderful task of human growth, healing, salvation, finding love, and what really matters. If we're so much time consumed, with so much of our time is consumed, is consumed with distractions that uh, lead nowhere, such as good stuff sometimes, good work, you know, all these things. So that's why we need to have a special Sabbath every so often. We need to have those times of solemn, silent rest in which we think, in which we experience God's love uh, as our Father. And we let him through his spirit, not drunk with wine, but drunk with the spirit, we are led into uh, the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's a critical task. It's a critical task. If somebody did not do this, what we read in Leviticus 23, is that they would be cut off from their people. And it's not anybody that did this. It says God. He says that's what will happen. It's a description of what happens. If we don't apply ourselves as quickly as we can, as earnestly as we can to the task of our growth, uh, there's something that we're missing. We're missing the main purpose for our lives. You see what I mean? It's important to spend the time for this. And so there's a sense of alienation that can uh, take place in our own lives, uh, that we're disconnected from others, from uh, ourselves, and even, even from God if we don't spend the time. It's a critical task to apply ourselves to that task of the Day of Atonement. Of so what I wanted is to uh, end with this song that is from Bach. And uh, uh, what I like in it is it makes me think of the majesty of God. It starts with some royal uh, chords, and then you hear as well um, the tenderness of the Father. And uh, after this, I don't know if we want to sing again Amazing Grace, but uh, um, then I will sit down and we can. But as you listen to this, I'd like to ask you to consider the invitation to spend time with God, the safety of his love, to find out how it is that you can have lives that are freer from the blocks that have prevented you from accessing all of the beautiful things, the goodness, the liberty that God wants you to have.
Dear God, that's where we're going, and we thank you that in the uh, coming of Jesus, we understand that somehow we are already there in the safety from the fear of, uh, of death and of all kind of fears, and we can enjoy the safety that there is in your love. Um, in this, help us through your spirit to do the work that is needed, the good work of growing up, to find out what it is that we're afraid, what it is that the little boy in us gets snappy, uh, what it is that we need to do so that we can stop being tripped up, tripped up uh, into, uh, into doing the things that are not helpful to us or to others. Help us to uh, take a good fast from the things that are in the way, uh, whether it uh, consumes our time in nothingness or whether it is things that just numb us and uh, do not allow us to take the full blunt of reality as it is so we can improve it uh, by your grace. Help us to do the work so we can enter uh, even now and then fully when Jesus comes into that Feast of Tabernacles that you're preparing for us. And we thank you for this because we ask this and we thank you for it and we receive it in the name of Jesus and for his sake.